This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Fadal Rahman, spokesperson for the Frontier Corps in Bajir tribal province, said that the Operation Lionheart, which was launched two months ago, has ended. He said that many Pakistani Taliban fighters surrendered and that the rest of them were banished while the forces took control of their military strongholds. He added that 90 Taliban armed men and 11 Pakistani soldiers were killed during the operation. Military sources believe that army elements spread in the area will remain there in the future in order to guarantee that the fighters will not return. Ahmed Zidane follows the developments in Islamabad. These are the remains and remnants of the Taliban fighters in the Pakistani Bajur tribal province after Operation Lionheart concluded after two months. The operation drove away the armed members from their strongholds. Al Jazeera is the first media outlet to enter the tunnels to see these books and the Taliban's military strongholds and headquarters. The weapons and and ammunition seized by the Pakistani forces reflect the Taliban's military and administrative capabilities in the area. This Taliban stronghold called the Ba Sinner has 18 to 20 tunnels. About 70 Taliban members set up religious courts and schools here. The house of their commander, Fakir Mohammed, was also here. They owned a large amount of weapons and ammunition, as we have discovered over here. The prominent success achieved by the Pakistani forces is exhibited by the surrender of dozens of Taliban armed men headed by Salar Mahsoud, who was the spokesman for the group in the region. Overall, there are about 600 armed men here. 40 or 50 of us armed men have joined the government, promising to cooperate with it to achieve peace. Pakistan is our country, and we want it to be peaceful and calm. These tribal militias, loyal to the government, partnered with the army to triumph over the militants. But elements of the army remain in the region, fearing the return of the militants who are thought to have escaped to Afghanistan. Experts believe that the bigger challenge facing the Pakistani army lies in its capability to resettle hundreds of thousands of displaced people who were driven away by the war in this region. Ahmed Zidan, Al Jazeera, Islamabad. Al Jazeera, Islamabad. Deputy commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, Hossein Salami, threatened to embargo Iran's oil supply to European countries. He said that Iran is capable of attacking any of them with missiles and reach its target. These threats come on the eve of the International Atomic Energy Agency's meeting in Vienna to discuss the new challenges rising from Iran's uranium enrichment. Political observers expect the new IAEA chief, Yukiya Amano, to adopt a more stern approach towards Iran. Amano, who took over the presidency of the IAEA from El Baradei, is also expected to present that tougher approach during the meeting. Amano indicated that Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapon design and expressed his suspicion of Syria's engagement in secret nuclear activities. We now turn to journalist and expert on the IAEA, Amir al-Bayati. He is with us on the phone. Mr. Bayati, welcome. 
As of now, several hours before the IAEA meeting, how clear is it that Amano's position on this issue is more stern in comparison to that of El Baradei? Actually, at the beginning of the Japanese Yukiya Amano's term in office, the IAEA resolution was strict and different than that of al -Baradis. He used to say that the agency does not cooperate, but also wanted to verify the accusations that Iran is conducting a nuclear program for military purposes. He would directly accuse some without specifically naming the West or certain countries. This is one difference. Yukiya Amano announced that the leaders in Tehran continue to reject meeting the IAEA inspector to examine some sites and refuse to reveal information relevant to various nuclear activities such as military studies they've conducted. And all this has become a means to pressure Iran. Mr. Amir, have these positions, or more precisely the signals that indicate Amano's positions, are they being used to prove something at the beginning of his term? Or do they actually reflect the positions that the IAEA's policies will be built upon during his next several years? This is not personal. Yukiya Amano works within his jurisdiction and Japan is considered to be an American and Western ally. This is a Western position because of the reality in Iran. The IAEA resolution or Yukiya Amano's considerations came within a briefing on Iran and up until now the agency refuses a series of sanctions meant to stop Iran from enriching uranium. While Iran has announced that it had enriched uranium to 20 percent inside the country, Yukiya Amano sent a message saying that uranium can be swapped within an agreement to take place inside Iran and not outside the country. Therefore, there is an escalation by all sides. The United Arab Emirates police confirmed that the foreign agents implicated in the assassination of Mahmoud al-Mabhouh are currently staying in Israel after having gone to five different destinations. Meanwhile, Dubai Police Chief Lieutenant General Dahi Khalfan called on the countries whose passports were used in the assassination to cooperate with his country. All those implicated in the assassination of al Mabouh are currently staying in Israel. This is the latest development in the case of the assassination of top Hamas leader Mahmoud al Mabouh, as announced by Dubai Police Chief Lieutenant General Dahi Khalfan. The number of suspects using foreign passports has reached 26. Halfan believes that their escape to Israel will help provide them protection, at least for now. However, once they leave Israel, they will be subject to arrest as their names and descriptions have been circulated by the International Police Interpol. The list includes 12 British, 6 Irish, 4 French, 3 Australians and a German, according to their passports. The Dubai police chief called on the countries whose passports were used in the assassination to cooperate with his country. He further said that Israel avoided using U.S. passports due to fears that it may affect the distinctive relations between Washington and Tel Aviv. Dubai police said that forensic evidence has shown that al mabouhs killers used a drug to sedate him before suffocating him to death. The medical exam the examiner's report shows that the victim was sedated in an attempt to suppress evidence of foul play. Meanwhile, another European national is believed to be the 27th suspect in the case. Also, two Palestinians residing in the United Arab Emirates who initially fled to Jordan were later extradited to the UAE. Joining us from Dubai is our correspondent, Mahmoud Hamdan. Is it confirmed that all the suspects are now in Israel? 
Lechbib, this has not been confirmed. The Dubai police chief said that he's sure that all suspects have fled to Israel, but he still needs evidence to corroborate the case. All fingers point to the Israeli Mossad confirming that Israel was behind the assassination. The investigation shows that the passports were used without the knowledge of their owners. It also shows that the holders of these passports have resided at one point or another in Israel, or had established contact with Israel. However, the Dubai police have not provided any definite evidence so far that implicates the Mossad in the case. There are only demands by the Dubai police chief for the Mossad to confess. Parallel to that, Israeli officials continue to deny any connection to the case. Dubai police are also mounting pressure on the countries whose passports were used in the assassination to cooperate with the UAE. The use of passports violated the sovereignty of these nations, and this is very serious. Through these countries, Dubai is seeking to mount pressure on Israel in order to help locate the suspects. According to the Dubai police chief, their escape to Israel will help protect the suspects for now. However, as soon as they leave Israel, they will be subject to arrest. If they stay in Israel, Israel will help protect them. This is where all the pressure comes into play. Dubai is calling on all the appropriate authorities to pressure Israel into arresting these wanted suspects. The Palestinian Authority has called for U.S. intervention to stop what it referred to as ongoing Israeli aggressions against Al-Aqsa Mosque and the entire Palestinian territories. Meanwhile, nearly 20 Palestinians were wounded in clashes with Israeli forces which had reportedly stormed the Al-Aqsa compound. In response, some Palestinian youths threw rocks at tourists near the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The security situation in East Jerusalem has escalated after Israeli forces stormed Al-Aqsa Mosque and escorted hundreds of Jewish tourists to the compound. This part clashes between Israeli forces and Muslim worshippers converging inside the mosque. Clashes also erupted between Palestinian youth and the Israeli army in the old city of Jerusalem. Jewish extremists stormed the Holy Aqsa Mosque. Al-Aqsa squares and compound are all parts of the Holy Mosque. Muslim worshippers converging inside Al-Aqsa Mosque warn of dire confrontations if the Israeli army continues to impose a siege around the mosque and continues to prevent Palestinians under the age of 50 from entering the compound. Some worshippers use the mosque's speakers to call on Palestinians to rush and protect the mosque after Jewish extremists threaten to storm it. This news comes after dozens of Jewish extremists who have been reportedly drinking held a similar protest across the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron amidst heavy police presence in the area. As you may know, there were reports of fierce clashes in the area. Four Israeli police officers as well as seven Palestinians were injured in the clashes. There were no reports of excessive force and the situation is back to normal. I believe that Israel reserves its right, legitimacy and jurisdiction over this site. It seems that the territories are bracing for more violence following an Israeli decision to add the Ibrahimi Noble Sanctuary and the Bilal ben Rabah Mosque to its list of Jewish heritage sites. This decision is still casting its shadow on the Palestinian territories. This may lead to days, if not weeks, of violent confrontations between the Palestinians armed with rocks on one side and Israelis armed with tear gas and rubber bullets on the other. If not contained, the situation may spiral into a full-fledged Palestinian intifada which was called for by Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Residents of Al Musara region, located in the middle of the Gaza Strip, are living under difficult conditions due to repeated Zionist aggressions, the latest of which destroyed three homes. Our correspondent, Mohammed Shah, visited the area and brought us the following report. We make a living from olives. My aunts are orphans, and this is their only source of income. God is great. 
This is criminal. They destroyed our homes, our olive trees. We have nothing left. Why all this animosity against the Palestinians? This is the situation that the Abu Shiada family is living under, east of the Al Musadar region, in the middle of the Gaza Strip, after the Zionists came to the area during a raid on the town. They raided their home, raising it to the ground. This is what has become of the olive trees relied upon by the three sisters to make a living. We are three sisters. Our livelihood and our lives come from these olives. Ever since we were little kids, we subsist because of them. They destroyed our work. We tended the land until it became viable and a source of income. They destroyed and ruined our whole lives. The bin Syed family was also a victim of the raid. Two of their houses were destroyed and a large field planted with olive trees was bulldozed. They uprooted these olive trees. All of the olive trees were destroyed. They also destroyed the bath tower and killed the donkey that was right there. What can I say? This woman and her children are from the bin Syed family. They don't have anything left anymore except for this patch of land where her two mentally challenged children are sitting. She is waiting for her husband who went to appeal to supporting organizations to help him find work, but he came back with nothing. He reprimanded his children to finish their homework so they can sit outside with their mother and grandmother. They bulldozed the houses without any reason. I've lived here for many years. I mean, where are they going to sleep? How are they going to stay warm? Where are they going to eat and drink? قتل مسلحون عائلة مكونة من أم وبناتها. A family consisting of a mother and her three daughters was killed near Al Dabash in Al Haria district in northwest Baghdad. This is the second event of its kind to take place in Baghdad in the past 24 hours. In southern Baghdad, in the suburb of Madain, Baghdad police had previously announced the arrests of four gang members who used silenced guns to kill a family of eight. Government forces allegedly arrested nine wanted individuals during search and raid operations in Bakuba, Mugdadiya, Al Atam, and Jawala in the Diyala province. American occupation forces arrested five people, including three police officers, during search and raid operations in northern Bakuba, the center of Diyala province. In the center of Wasit province, police arrested two people allegedly involved in an operation in al Sawera in northern Kut. Members of parliament said that the latest reassignments and transfers in the Iraqi National Intelligence Agency were aimed at enabling the Dawa party to take control of the agency ahead of the upcoming parliamentary elections. Al-Maliki's objective is to influence the decision of Iraqi voters. The reassignments and transfers in the national Iraqi intelligence were not made due to blatant security failures or to increase security ahead of the upcoming parliamentary elections. Rather, al-Maliki's objective is to achieve political gains for the Dawa party that he leads. He is trying to stay in power and is using any means possible while disregarding material and human costs. The reassignments and transfers are alarming due to their objective and timing. Members of the parliament reiterated that al-Maliki's objective is to pave the way for his Dawa party to take control over the National Intelligence Agency. They stated that al-Maliki replaced many former intelligence officers who were known for their neutral positions with those loyal to his party with the objective of influencing the decision of Iraqi voters. They also said that al-Maliki is trying to put these intelligence agencies directly under his control so he can use them for political gains during the elections. The members of parliament also said that al-Maliki used a similar technique during the provincial elections. At the time, he provided tribal councils with large sums of money as a way to gain their loyalty. During the past two months, al-Maliki issued direct orders to transfer directors, consultants, as well as senior and low-ranking officers. 
These officers have been assigned to civilian positions in various ministries, positions that are not necessarily related to their areas of expertise. Political observers believe that this sets a dangerous precedent that can potentially destroy a critical agency for the purpose of achieving election gains. They were recently integrated into the intelligence and government agencies, which raises questions about these reassignments and their timing. It was meant to be a deadly and clandestine operation in Dubai, the assassination of a Hamas military commander, Mahmoud al-Mabhouh. And it was deadly, but hardly clandestine. Much of the operation was captured by the hotel's security cameras. And the global media had what they seldom have when it comes to these kinds of news stories, some intriguing pictures to help tell the story. The Dubai government made sure of that by feeding those images to the media and then all eyes turned to Israel and the prime suspect in the case, Mossad, Israel's secret intelligence agency. Israel has a policy when it comes to these kinds of operations. It neither confirms nor denies that it's responsible, leaving the media to investigate and speculate. That's our starting point this week, a hotel in Dubai, a team of hitmen in tennis gear, and the grainy stop-motion video images that shed some light on an operation that was supposed to happen in the dark. It looks like something out of a movie, but this is real-life footage. It has all the ingredients of a spy thriller. Dubai police say security camera video tracked an 11-member hit squad traveling on false European passports. You have faces, real faces. You have video footage. The footage showed the killers gathering before the murder. This is the first time that you have a Mossad operation filmed on camera. It does bear the hallmarks of a typical Mossad operation. You can call it the reality show of the Mossad. The problem for Mossad is that this was reality. What was the hit team thinking? That a major hotel in a modern state like Dubai has no security cameras? It's not often that you get 27 minutes of footage showing step by step the arrival of the perpetrators sticking out the hotel. We see them in the lobby trying to check in, standing beside Al Mabhu. They follow him in the lift. They emerge from the lift, they follow in the corridors. This is, you know, James Bond territory here, and it does show a little bit for us ordinary people how these things work. By supplying the media with the video evidence, the Dubai authorities essentially gave reporters the raw materials they need to tell the story, lifting the lid on the usually shadowy world of espionage. The Dubai police deserve credit for that, maybe even a production credit. CCTV footage is perfect for the TV viewer. There's something exciting going on. There is something happening. We need to see more. The picture in this case was, of course, a uh, dream for uh, journalists, for people in television and in print to really watch the images, to know exactly what happened and so forth. In terms of, of the global media, there's a tendency to play up the cloak and dagger aspect of the whole uh, story. I mean, it's about espionage, it's about, uh, uh, you know, infiltration and assassination. And, and this is something that sells newspapers. The Israeli coverage of the assassination was a story told in two parts. The first phase was full of positive reviews for Mossad. The second phase was much more critical. Channel 10 was in Dubai standing there saying, uh, well, of course, if this indeed was Mossad and talking about the operation as if, of course, it's something to be very proud of. So this was the atmosphere, something very smug. But when it turned out that the agents left a little memento, the images on the CCTV, something that even a bunch of kids trying to break into a corner shop wouldn't do nowadays, then the whole atmosphere has changed. There was suddenly a sense of, here we go again, this is another one of these Mossad fiescos. Israel's policy of neither confirming nor denying Mossad operations has been described as constructive ambiguity. And on this story, the government stuck to that policy. 
They never comment either way about allegations that Mossad was involved. They don't have the habit of holding press conferences. Foreign Ministry sources today. This whole standard we don't deny and, and we can't confirm is basically what you're going to get out of uh, Israeli officials. Saying things like Israel has not taken responsibility for this operation so surely we cannot comment but we just want to say that if somebody is going to mess with us we're going to mess with them back. But the Israeli media has been doing a fantastic job in uncovering a lot of things that we have not knew about. The Israeli media is divided, but they are all agreed on the objective, killing al mabhu Israeli media coverage has not been limited to news broadcasts. The satire show on Israeli television is considered to be almost a seismograph of the Israeli mood. <laughs> We've already seen the mocking the operation and they had it all typecasted with the you know, temptation girl who was there accompanied by four geeks who hardly know what they're doing. So the whole sense was like we're pretending to be James Bond but actually uh, we don't really know what we're doing. And I think this is the atmosphere in Israel this week about this whole operation. Arab coverage combined anger at Israel with glee over Israel's PR nightmare as well as some intra-Palestinian conspiracy theories. There is the issue, of course, of allegations of involvement of operatives of the Palestinian Authority security elements from Hamas rival Fatah, and perhaps even of a Hamas operative himself who may have led the Israelis to uh, Mahor's location. One newspaper says, how can a Hamas leading figure fly from Damascus to Dubai and the Mossad agents are waiting for him at the airport. How did they know which flight he is catching? The media outlets covering this story were all handed the same video, the same evidence, by the Dubai police. So they all had the same starting point. But what went out on the air and in print was markedly different. It was a textbook case of the news divide between the Israeli and Arab worlds. Israeli media always seems to be extremely surprised when somebody is trying to stand in Mossad's way and our desire to just go out there and kill somebody in New Zealand, in Dubai, in Jordan. So there's almost no sense of a need to be apologetic about it. So the Arab media say, why Israel get away with murder? It's used by assassins. Is Israel above international law? And if a Western person is killed in an Arab country, Whoever does it, for whatever motive, he's a terrorist. Whereas to Israel, it's an intelligence operation, it's a clever thing to do. A clever thing to do, unless the stealth operation by your secret intelligence agency ends up on television for all of the world to see. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.